Yeah, he's and, at prayer uh, palace. He's tonight. at the prayer palace. So I, I thought, you know what, we would start by praying for him. How's that? Sure, sounds good. Is that good. okay? Can we do that? We welcome everyone on Catch the Fire TV. And we're so glad you're here with us, joining us wherever you are around the world. So let's stand, shall we? And just pray for Benny Hinn Ministries and uh, pray for the church, the prayer piles tonight. And then we'll begin to pray for our meeting tonight as well. Father, I just ask right now that you would, all over this city, Lord, we have a vision to have a citywide church. We have a vision for the kingdom to grow. And Father, we ask that your kingdom would advance in the city. Even tonight, we would see incredible miracles, signs, wonders. Father, would you have your way? Would your glory come into each and every house that's across this city tonight? In this place, Lord, we're asking for your presence to come to overshadow us, your glory to visit us. We're asking for an outpouring of your spirit again because we're so hungry and desperate for more, Lord. We love you. Father, just as it has rained this week, we ask that you would rain on us tonight. Father, we thank you that, that it, everything has turned from desert to forest overnight across the city. And Father, that's what we ask for in our lives and in our ministries, and that you would just overwhelm everything with your growth and your fruitfulness. And we thank you for that, Father. We just, we just thank you, and we're, we're just ready to receive your rain tonight. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Yes, Lord, tonight we ask that praises would lift up unto your name and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. All right. You ready to worship? Good. Let's worship, shall we? Bill, Sue, guys, exciting night.
water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you oh, Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. The water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you shine and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you oh none like you well our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome and power is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? Then if our God is with us, who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is for us, Stand again. Oh, water you turn into wine. Oh, water you turn into wine. Oh, water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. Oh, water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Oh, none like you. Well, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God. No. Our God is greater. If our God is for us, then who can never stop us? And if our God is with us, then who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can never stop us? And if our God is with us, who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can never stop us? And if our God is with us, who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can never stop us? And if our God is with us, Stand again. No one, no one, no one.
nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have no mercies for me every day Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Not things below, not things above, not the past, not the future, not things under the earth, above the earth, but all around. Oh, nothing can separate. death, no life, no past or future, nothing can separate from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. It's all about the cross. It's all about the love of the Father. Nothing can separate. Open seas, 
your love never fails the chasm is far too wide we never thought we'd reach the other side but your love never fails
my heart is in you are faithful to answer with words that are true and a hope that is real as I feel your touch you bring a freedom to all that's within in the safety of this place a longing to pour out my heart to say to me all that I have led and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light come on to me who has no money come and buy come and buy come and buy pour out our hearts to know that we To say that I'm thankful, pour out my heart. To say that you're wonderful, pour out my heart. To say that I love you, pour out my heart. To say that I need you, pour out my heart. To say.
Tired and you're thirsty. See you. 
Worship is always personal. It's always a song of romance between you and your Savior. Each person has their own words that mean the most to them. For a moment, raise a word just to him that's just yours. Kind, close, near, giver of hope, giver of life, you are my friend, you are my closest friend, my compassion is captured in your song before you. i mm -hmm. 
Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And though precious is the There's nothing but the blood, Lord. We declare it tonight, all over this room, Lord. Every post in this place, every post in our lives, Lord, every corner of our lives, in the lives of our family, the doorposts, right now, we just proclaim the blood. We declare the blood over the doorpost of our lives right now. Nothing goes in without your permission, Lord. Nothing goes in. We declare the blood over this place in Jesus' name, over our lives, Lord. You are amazing, Lord. You've sacrificed for us, Lord. You've paid it all, the price, the amazing price. You are amazing. Your glory is in this place, in this house. Amazing. Oh, blood of Jesus. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Actually, I have a, a funny story I just couldn't stop thinking of while we are singing that. When um, we, have, we have five children. My name is Naomi, and this is Bruno. And um, when the kids were little, we lived in a Jewish neighborhood, like totally Jewish. So it was, it was okay to have a big family because nobody looked twice at you because there was a lot of 
big Jewish families. So anyway, we lived in this Jewish neighborhood, and, and those were the days where you didn't have bank machines. You had to stand in line at the teller. Do you remember those days? Okay. So I'm standing in line. I've got one in a car seat and two running circles around me at this point. And um, we're in this Jewish neighborhood, and my one who had just, like, just turned four looks up to me with her big eyes, and she says, she stops running. And there's two people in front of me in line, about six behind me, totally Jewish neighborhood. She says, Mommy, why the blood of Jesus? Really loud. And it was one of those, oh, God moments. Help me now. <laughs> and, um, and I looked at her, and I go, well, honey, it's to give you a bath on the inside. Oh, okay. And she goes back running. And I was like, Whew, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So yes, his blood gives us a bath on the inside. Amazing. Amazing. Give us a bath, Lord. We yes. want it. A bath on the inside, on the outside, all around us. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Well, welcome everyone from Catch the Fire TV watching tonight. We absolutely bless you and we thank you that you're tuned in. Mm -hmm. Well, it might not be tonight in your, wherever you are. It could be morning, it could be afternoon, but welcome. And welcome to all of you. Um, how many know who are guest speakers are tonight the killstras yeah. okay and we we are thrilled to have them we and are. i i know catch the fires but personally they've meant a great deal to the two of us they've as saved well. our lives well they've helped to they helped to yeah. <laughs> Jesus has saved us. Jesus our lives. has saved us. Yeah. And, and they've pushed us along the way a few That's times. That's right. Encourage us to seek him. Yes. How many folks are here for the uh, re restoring the foundation school. Anyone? Yeah, look all at right. you all. Wow. wow, that's great. It's about 70. Yeah. And tomorrow is a big day for you, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Soul Spirit Hurts tomorrow. It's yeah. the third session, isn't it? Great. And Demonic. And Demonic uh, yeah. is the following? Yeah, yeah that's right. It wraps up tomorrow, yeah, it wraps up. It? yeah, Great. So fantastic. You know what? Does anyone have a burning testimony that's been part of the school that just feels... Anyone? Just... Wave if you feel like you you want to share something God's been doing. Okay, well let school. me just tell you something they taught me. Okay, because like okay. I am a living testimony. So I grew up. My family are like pastors and missionaries for like 14 generations. Okay, I did not want to marry a pastor. <laughs> did not like last on the list. You know how you make your list? That was like at the real bottom, like off the list. We See, met in Bible school. I don't understand yeah. that really. Well, it was a Christian university. Oh, just about the same I wasn't thing. there for Bible school. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, he was a construction manager when I married him. And so we, you know, we, you know, we go through life, and life is good. And he, then he, every once in a while, he drops this thing, I want to be a pastor. And I go, no, you don't. And everything in me goes, no, you don't. <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, I want to be a pastor. And I go, oh, no, you don't. And... Um, so, so, you know, we go through our life, and eventually he becomes a pastor. But on the way, I have to get some healing, right? I have to get some pretty serious healing along the way because I have this huge fear issue. And so we were in this one leaders meeting. I don't think they even remember being leading it, but it was a leaders meeting upstairs, and they were, they were speaking. And they did this little exercise with us that it has revolutionized my life. It's regarding fear. And they said... What I want you to do is I want you to see yourself closing the door to fear because it's a doorway, and you can choose to go through it or not. And then I want you to take Jesus' hand and walk through the door that he opens, and you can name that door too. And it has totally changed my life because every time my fear comes up, I know I, it's my choice to walk into anxiety, walk into fear, or walk where Jesus would have me walk with his authority with him in hand. And so, like, for me, that, that little tool and what they teach you is just new ways of doing life. And that was a new way of doing life for me. So are you happy you married a pastor, Pastor? I'm still deciding sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, why don't you do something? Smile at someone. Just say, you're absolutely beautiful. You're wonderful. Jesus absolutely loves you. Oh, You're in the house of God. It's amazing to be in here. Friday night, and God is with us. Isn't it amazing? He's the most awesome one in this place. Did you know that? He's the most real in this place as well. The most present is Jesus in this place. We forget that, isn't he? He's more present than your very existence. 
He's real, and he's in this place. It's amazing to be here. Well, we want to do our best to just have a couple of announcements. And the first one is that we have David and Faith Daly. Does anyone know the Dallies? Yeah. They're amazing couple. Well, they're coming for the UK, and they're going to be teaching in our school. Well, no, they won't be teaching in our school ministry, but there's a Father Heart School. And then Friday, they're going to be here. Mm -hmm. So you, don't, you won't want to miss that. They're here Friday night as well. If, if so. you've never had a real impartation of the Father's love and, and the mother love of God, because, you know, he's both. He's male and, fem, male and female in one. So he, he has, like, all the compassion and, and still all the father, fatherliness. So he, they're just, they just overwhelm you with it and are amazing. So come and receive that impartation from them. It's incredible. It's incredible. The following week, we, we're going to have an In His Presence week with Murray Duick. Does anyone know the Duicks? Yeah, the Duicks are an amazing couple, and they'll be here with Jeremy and Connie, and it's going to be in the evening. So it's going to be a great time to come and just be in His presence. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. Murray and I think there was a prophet book. coming from India. Paul Kumar will be here the following week. Huh? Okay. So that's in three weeks. So. Yep. This summer is just lined up, action-packed with, with just speakers and really just seeking his face and just Holy Spirit just all over this place, really, this summer. And we're just so happy for it. Isn't it amazing? It is. Okay, honey, we want to get the Kielstras up as soon as possible. So I just want to let you all know that we're going to take an offering tonight. So in the pockets behind you, there are envelopes. And if you want a receipt, which is really great that our government allows us to do this, um, please fill that out in full while I do this little talk. Now, Luke 5 is an amazing Bible story from your childhood days where Jesus is out choosing the 12 disciples, okay? So he's looking to see who's going to follow him. And he comes upon Peter and on the lake. And I want you to understand something, that when Peter was approached by Jesus, it was the end of his day. Okay, how many of you at the end of your day may be a little testy sometimes? You may not want to be asked that one extra little thing to do. At least that's my case, you know. Bruno would say I turn into a pumpkin because I just, I want to go Around to bed. Around 8 o'clock. No, it's not that early. No. But I want to go to bed. Like, it's, it's like, okay, I have worked hard. My day starts when I work, because I, I work full time at York University. My day starts at 5.30 in the morning to, to get my time with God and everything else done before I go to work. Then I work a full day and then... Often we have meetings like this in the evening, and you know what? The last thing I want to do is be asked for one more thing just before I go to bed. I tend to get a little edgy, okay? I don't know about you. So this is the end of the day for Peter, and Jesus comes up to him, and he says, put your boat out into the deep. Launch into the deep. Launch into the deep, and let down your nets. And Peter goes, you know, you're a carpenter. You may not know a whole lot about fishing here. But that's something we do at night. And, but you know what? Peter lets him know that. But at the same time, he listens to God. And he puts his will in line with God's. Amen. And what happens? You know the story. The nets are full to overflowing. Because he decided, instead of getting all frustrated and let his cup, you know, get a little, you know, spill all over people in a negative way, he chose to line his heart up with Jesus. And what happened? Fruitfulness. There was an abundance. And this was, this was Peter's livelihood. Like this he could sell, and he could make money for his family. And it was because he let his heart be in that right place. He let his will come in line with Jesus' will for the moment. And so that's what I'm going to ask us to do right now, just to let our hearts and our wills come in line with what Jesus wants to do tonight. Yeah. So right now, Father, we hear your voice. We, yeah. we listen to yes. it. We open our ears. We open our hearts. And those places where we have been highly frustrated, where we go, oh, come on. We're trying to give you advice, just like Peter did. Oh, don't you know? Father, we don't want to give you advice tonight. We don't, Lord. We don't want our will to get in the way of what you want to do. Yeah. We want that abundance in our life, yeah. in every area in our finances, in our families, in our health. We want that abundance. Yeah. And so right now, we turn our hearts to agree with you. Mm. 
in Jesus' name. All right, ushers, where, do, where are all our ushers tonight? Why don't you guys come up? There's buckets in the front. And we're going to we'll, worship God we're, again. We're going to pass the buckets. We are? Yes. Yeah, so where are the ushers? Good. Right okay. there, there's the buckets. Perfect. Great. Yeah, we'll pass them around, and uh, we're going to worship again. So why don't you stand, and uh, we're just going to align our hearts, just like Naomi said. With, with the Lord tonight. We're going to align our spirits and say, yes, tonight we'll have it all. We'll take it all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's worship, shall we? Now, just before you sit down, I want you to just place your hand on your heart, and I want you to just declare this over yourself tonight. Father, I align my will with yours. I choose to love you forever and have your way tonight. Amen. All right. Well, let's welcome Chester and Betsy Kielstra. Yeah. Are you both coming up? Okay. Are we just about ready with the good? Okay, Chester. Okay. Oh, she's good, fine. 
Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Hallelujah. Well, good evening. All right. Oh, boy, you go way back. In fact, I was thinking and recalling the uh, first time that we came to uh, Toronto. And in those days, you looked all the way back. But uh, we came on April 7th, 1995. We were living in Florida, and we'd heard about this commotion going on up in the north. And some people had come back uh, different than what they'd gone. And so uh, we had an opportunity to get here, and we did. And I'll skip over a lot of the story. But um, one of the things we learned in Bible college is that the new moves of God are always persecuted by the previous move of God. And uh, it's something about, you know, we get our mindsets, we get our paradigms set. And when God gets out of our box and does something new, many people have trouble with that. Maybe some of you have. And, um, and so we decided we would not ever get into that condition. We would go check it out and test it, see if it really was God or not. But we would not just automatically condemn a move because we didn't understand it. And so um, we decided to come to Toronto and check it out. So we get up here and things are happening and uh, there's so many people to be prayed for they ask for volunteers to catch for carol and I, th I thought aha here is a good way to test this out i'll check this lady out and see if she's legitimate or not so i volunteered to be her catcher i and this one other guy well that night i caught about 200 people i would catch one by the time i got him down on the floor of course, the other guy was catching the next guy, and I ran over, caught the next one, put him down. So down the lines we went. And Carol was just going along. Oh, God, just touch him more, Lord. And she, would just, she was just floating along, you know. And meanwhile, me and this guy were working as hard as we could work. But by the end of that couple hours, well, maybe it was, an, I don't know, it was a long time, okay? I was so drunk in the spirit, I could hardly stand up. And so I was catching the people. And, oh, oh, this is so much fun, you know. And, um, and then Carol prayed for me and the other guy at the end, and that, that just finished me off, you know. So, so we decided that this sort of looked like it was really God, okay? She wasn't pushing people over. She wasn't doing anything. It was just by the spirit. And um, so we've been coming ever since. Here we are 17 years later, we can't stop coming here. So hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, it's been an awesome ride. So uh, we're so grateful for what God has done in this move. And by the way, have you noticed that more moves have occurred over the last 17 years? God is not a one-time God, you know? And they're coming faster and faster. So hallelujah. So anyway, uh, that's how we got introduced to this place, and through God's grace, we began to uh, be able to bring our ministry into here. So let's have a first overhead, and in case you don't know who we are, next one, please. Well, our ministry is called Restoring the Foundations Ministry. That was the name the Lord gave us when we uh, published our first book, and that's the name of the book, Restoring the Foundations. And the next uh, overhead is a joke. Can you handle jokes in church? Don't let worries kill you, let the church help. I still feel a little sorry for the person who put that sign up, those words on. But unfortunately, you know, over the years, by the way, our ministry has to do with helping people get healed. <laughs> um, most of the people we've had to minister to, let's see, let me rephrase that. Many of the wounds that people have, have come from being in the church. And you know, it really shouldn't be that way. Church should be a place where we receive healing. Uh, churches should be hospitals, I'm sure you've heard that. And um, it doesn't always seem to be that way. And I understand why, but I still wished it wasn't that way. But anyway, it's given us plenty to do over the years. We have not run out of people who need to be healed. So let's have the next overhead. We have an amazing privilege because when God called us to go to Bible college, which was a long time ago now, 19, 
84, we went to Bible college. What's that? I can't compute that many numbers. That's 16, 26, 28 years ago. My gosh, where has it all gone to, Betsy? It was just a few years ago. Yeah. Anyway, as we were getting ready to go to Bible college, well, even before we were getting ready to go to Bible college, um, God was just drawing us into the things of the Spirit. This was all very new to us. And um, we were going to this Methodist church, and we heard about this prayer meeting that was going to happen. And the lady who was hosting was all excited, really wanted us to come. She said, this traveling prophet is coming through, and he's going to pray for people. And somehow I didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to be excited about that. A traveling prophet, what's that? I knew about John the Baptist. And I said to Betsy, let's go find out what he's going to wear. You know? What's he, what's he eat? You know? I didn't know about prophets. I tried to know about profit and loss, but even that was a little skimpy. You know, that was... So anyway, we go to this meeting, and this nice little elderly man is there. At least by our standards in those days, he was elderly. And... Um, he has this nice little message, and he, he prays for people. And he comes to us, and he starts saying these words, and it didn't sound like a prayer to me. Um, and the part that we really caught was, yes, God says it's time to go to Bible. No, to go and get prepared. That's what he said. There are groups of people waiting for you around the world to bring your message. So we're driving home, and Betsy turns to me, and she says, Chester, do you have a message? <laughs> and I said, no, no. Do you have a message? No. What is he talking about? But we had, our hearts had been drawing to go to Bible college, and even though it didn't make sense, we said, okay, we're going to go. That's what he meant. That's what going and getting prepared meant. So we went to Bible college, and we... Um, that got set up within a week. I mean, it was just miraculous. Go to Bible college, and during the first year, God shows us our message. We get trapped. We go to a cell group that's full of people called to bring healing to the body of Christ. And we're practicing on each other. And one day, it's like I get hit with this revolution, uh, revolution this revelation about how to receive God's healing and why it's so sporadic why some people seem to and some don't. And so we've been bringing this message around the world really since 1990. It's been so much fun. So the next overhead shows us the revelation. May I? These are the key facets that make up Restoring the Foundations ministry, and they are needed for everybody to get deep and permanent healing. And I'm talking mostly about healing of the heart, but it just covers everything. The first thing, of course, is forgiveness. That underlies everything. That's not one of the four that we count. The next source of all our problems comes out of the second commandment, where God talks about how much he hates idols, he says you not serve them, bow down to them, worship them. For I, the Lord thy God, am an angry God, red God, jealous God, depending on your translation, visiting the iniquities of the fathers for three or four generations of those who hate me. And then praise the Lord for the next scripture, but loving kindness on the thousands of those who love me. So what happens is this. When we put our trust in something other than the true and living God, there's a curse that's released. When our ancestors put their trust in something other than the true and living God, curses were released. And the curse is that the iniquity of the heart, the heart tendency to sin, the pressure for the descendants to enter into the same kind of sin, just goes on down for three or four generations. Well, that turns out to be pretty severe. And you'll hear it as Betsy shares her testimony a little bit later. But if you turn around and look back up your family line, how many people's sin or iniquity are there in four generations that are affecting you? How many of you have two parents? Everybody? Two parents? 
Now you might have uh, step parents, you might have uh, foster parents, whatever. They have an influence, but of course the most influence comes from the biological. So two parents, four grandparents, that makes eight great-grandparents, and 16 great-greats. So 16 plus eight plus four plus two is 30 people whose iniquity of their heart, whenever they put their trust in something other than the true and living God and broke God's laws, their iniquity is visited onto you. Ouch. This is why it's so important to be careful what family you get born into. Okay? <laughs> you need to be more selective. You know? And we're born in all kinds of families, aren't we? Some are quite godly. They do the best they can. They pray to their limit of their understanding of God and God's nature and the, the full gospel that they, as they understand it. And other family lines are a real mixture, and some are just really, really awful. And the iniquities in those awful family lines trap the descendants generation after generation to just enter into and make their own the very same sins as what their parents and, and um, further back ancestors were doing. So this is what we all get born into. I, call, I see it like a cocoon. It's like this encapsulation. And we get born into it, and we're being pressed, pressed from every side by the ancestral sins and curses. Now, a balancing word is the blessings also come down the family line for thousands of generations. Hallelujah for that. And so we all inherit you know, our good looks, our uh, you know, family treasures, silver, gold, things like that. And, uh, and so it's not just all bad. But whatever's there in the side of curses and sins, that's really why Jesus came to set us free. And we have that in Galatians 3.13. It says, he became sin on our behalf. He took our place. He exchanged the sin and curses coming into our lives. He took them on and gave us the blessings and the righteousness. Hallelujah. That's an amazing exchange that he did for us. When he hung on the cross, he not only took all the sins of the world, but he took all the consequences of the sin, which is what the curses are coming down the family line. But we have to appropriate it into our lives. We have to learn about it, gain faith for it. Everything we get comes by faith, right? And then receive it into our lives. And Jesus came that we can do that. So here we are. We're born in this cocoon, this imperfect family. By the way, if anybody has a perfect family, I'd like to know about it. I've been looking for a long time. So I'd like to meet you. Uh, come up after the, after the uh, service tonight, okay? But anyway, we get born into these dysfunctional um, families, and we mistreat each other, we hurt each other, and so we need to get freedom from these sins and curses. But then on the next two points, we bring up both uh, points, please. The ungodly beliefs, and the next one, soul, spirit, hurts. We get hurt growing up in this imperfect family. Our heart gets hurt. We get rejection, abandonment. Uh, most of us enter into a condition we now call the orphan lifestyle. We have the orphan heart. We expect bad things to happen to us. We think we're all alone. We have to take care of ourselves. And Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, I've come to heal the brokenhearted because he knew we were going to need this. And you may not think your heart's broken, but it's at least damaged, it's scratched, it's torn. You might have a Band-Aid or two here or there. Frequently, when we're ministering to someone, God will show them a picture of their heart. And it can be pretty sobering at times. So we need our hearts healed, but they get hurt growing up in this family. And so it's usually called inner healing by most people. But not only do we get our heart hurt, but out of those wounds, we, we figure out how the world goes on, how the world works. We humans are very curious, you know, and we have to understand things. And the natural mind of man is continually struggling to make sense out of what's going on. Why am I being abused every day? Why is my daddy beating me up all the time? What's the matter with me is the question that re usually arises. And we decide there must be something really bad. I don't know what it is, but if I were somehow better, 
behaved better, did more, did less, did something different, uh, this would stop happening to me. And everywhere we come to a conclusion about how the world works, and it doesn't agree with what God says, even though it's based on our experience, every time we come to that conclusion that's contrary to the Word of God or the nature of God, we call that an ungodly belief. It's a lie that we're believing in. Who's the father of lies? You all know who the father of lies is, right? He wants us to believe these lies because everywhere we believe a lie then, we give more legal opportunity, more place for his oppression. And that's the fourth area that we have up here, demonic oppression, where we need to cast out demons. Yes, plain old fashioned deliverance, casting out of demons. Now, not the way they used to do it, where they bounced off the walls and fought all night. What the Lord showed us, if we would minister to these first three areas and recover the legal ground, the legal rights, the uh, place, as it says in uh, Ephesians 4, 27, give no place to the devil, 27, 28, 29, give no place to the devil. When we recover that legal ground by doing what the Lord uh, provided for us on the cross, then we can easily remove the demonic oppression because they no longer have a right to stay. We only have oppression as long as sin is present. And that's what gives the demons a right. So what the Lord showed us that one, one day I was sitting there, it was like it all came together in Bible college. Wow, we can all really get healed if, because these four areas not only exist, but each one holds the other three in place. By the way, besides the gold and the silver and your good looks, you inherited the family demons. You know, they're coming down the family line as well called familiar spirits, as generation after generation enters into the same sins. So anyway, that's what we call the Restoring the Foundations Ministry, and we say we do the integrated approach because all four of these areas have to be ministered to in a unified way. I think we've got one more bullet on that, do we? Ongoing cooperation with the Holy Spirit, walking it out, changing our behaviors to match now the freedom that we've gotten in the spirit realm, is very important. So that's it. That's the essence of the message that God gave us and that we've been carrying for quite a few years. And it just gets better and better. There's been so many revelations added on top of this, special ways that the devil gets us trapped. And, uh, and then God's shown us how to get out of it, how to help other people get out. So I was going to ask uh, Bob and Joyce if you'd come up and just give a little testimony for a moment. Do we need a microphone or is are these them? I just met Bob and Joyce tonight. I've never met them before, but I guess they've known about Betsy and I for a while. So Hello. God bless you. Why don't you just share how RTF has impacted your life? <laughs> yeah, RTF uh, transformed our life. I really did. Um, I guess in 1999, we figured out it was 99, okay. the summer of 99. We actually stayed in the Kilstra's house. They were away ministering somewhere and one of their team ministered to us so uh, uh, transformed our lives. I, I was saved in 1980 into a deliverance church <laughs> of all things and that fell apart and after that, that fell apart in 1990, after that I've, I've kept going to church but I fell away from the Lord and uh, I didn't really have enough in me to, to keep me solid and uh, really started allowing the enemy through, um, I guess, the sins of the Father, the curses, the ungodly beliefs, and my own rejection to completely destroy my marriage. Um, by the time we finally got connected with Restoring the Foundation, our marriage was over. It was finished. Mm. Um, we flew into Orlando. Uh, I was standing in the airport, and my first time ever in my life, I did one of these and spent the whole week like that. I couldn't straighten up. Uh, the wow. enemy tried to knock us off the road several times on the way to their house. I guess up to the Panhandle would be yeah. five, six hours probably. Yeah, that's 
quite a drive. Uh -huh. And a uh, truck tried to run us off the road, and we, we almost gave up and just turned around and went home. And we were so, so broken and so hopeless. And uh, just, just a really, really empty place uh, with no hope. So the good news is, <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll share a bit of my side of the story. I grew up in a Christian home, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, got um, filled with spirit at five, knew how to pray, intercede, and really stand in warfare. He came from a very ungodly home. He was the only one. I prayed him into the kingdom by the Lord's um, um, direction, and we had had a good marriage. We have always been in leadership in the church, and it went AWOL, and even though we were still in leadership in the church, Bob in his heart walked away from the Lord because of pain. And during that time, I continued to intercede, and our marriage, I became suicidal, very mm. depressed. Mm. And if any marriage thinks they're hopeless, we were there, but it doesn't matter what your problem is in marriage, if you will be transparent with the Lord and allow him to dig into the deepest parts of your heart. That week at the Kilstra's home was the heart, one of the hardest weeks of our life, but one of the greatest weeks of our life. And as Bob said, everything went wrong in terms of trying to get there. Satan did everything in his power to keep us from receiving the healing. We went there in complete desperation. It was going to end our, we were either going to end our marriage or we're going to be getting free. And Satan tried to stop us. And even with the suicidal stuff in the tendency, it was what the generational curses. Um, anyway, we got there. Allowed, part of the reason we also went to, to Florida to receive healing is because of the shame of what we were struggling with in our home, being in leadership in the church. We wanted to be with someone anonymous. We wanted, we just needed help. It was a new teaching that we hadn't heard before. And all I know is that all four components of God's healing are really necessary to get life-changing results in our lives. We've had lots of counseling within the church, outside of the church, spent money, spent time. But until you deal with the root causes, you will never be free. And that was in 1999. So we were in our 17th year then and not happy. <laughs> and we are now 29 and happier than we've ever been. So I would challenge you, let the Lord do the work as hard as it can be sometimes, you will be thankful and you will get free if you make that choice to let him help you through it. And I really wanna thank Chester and Bess Betsy for their, their, their pioneering in this, in this realm because I'm sure it was a tough time. But we bless you and we thank you. Good, good, thank you. Thank you, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you. Your, your story made it all worthwhile. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have this little saying that uh, restoring the foundations is not marriage counseling. We minister to two individuals, and what happens is their marriage gets changed more than any marriage counseling ever did. Doesn't hurt to take marriage counseling, but it works a lot better after you've gotten your own stuff taken care of. Okay, if we could have the overhead again. I want to go on to the next one. And I want to talk a little bit more about our story. We got through Bible college, took us six years to do a two-year Bible college. There were some reasons. We weren't just slow. And um, 1990, we had the official start of our ministry and started going church to church. And it wasn't long after that we began to have prophetic words about uh, a training center. God said he wanted to give us a training center, and different ones had different descriptions. But uh, the summary was something like this. For a season, I'm going to send you to the nations, and then the day will come when I give you a place of your own, and I'm going to bring the nations to you. And by then, we knew enough about the prophetic to not try to make things happen on our own. So we just kept doing what we were doing, going from church to church, ministering to leaders, training uh, people to do the Restoring the Foundations ministry, establishing programs in the church. And that was going well. We, uh, we began to travel other nations, and that was a lot of fun to take God's message to groups of people who were waiting for us throughout the world. It was just amazing to watch that prophetic word come to pass. But then in 2002, the Lord said it was time to do the training center, about two years or 10 years 
from the time we'd had the first word. So some things take a while to work out. And uh, we went on a prophetic journey. I won't take time tonight to tell it, but we ended up at Echo Mountain Inn in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So here's a picture of it on the outside. It looks like this old English inn, stone and wood, and it's just a beautiful building. And the main part of it was built in 1896. So that's really old, isn't it? I mean, that's what, 116 years ago now. And of course, when we go to the UK, they just laugh at us when they talk about our old English inn. But anyway, for us, it's an awesome thing. The next overhead shows an aerial view, and the portion over, <clears throat> over on the left was what was built originally, and then it got added to in the 1920s. And the north wing on the right was built. No, don't go ahead yet. Stay where, back up, please. Um, on the main building on the left, I got uh, dining rooms, commercial kitchens added to it. And then in the 1960s, these buildings over on the right uh, got added. So another 11 units added. So the whole place has uh, 22 guest rooms in the main building, 11 in the uh, second building for a total of 33. So we can have quite a training session there. We can have people come for ministry year round. We can have people come for training. And we started training in the winter, which had been when the inn was closed. And so we uh, are able to operate year-round, training center in the winter, and a regular B&B &B open to the public in the summer and the fall. And so even right now, this weekend, this Friday night, I hope every room is occupied at Echo Mountain Inn, and a lot of money is coming into the ministry to support the ministry. So we are a marketplace ministry. We're the marketplace and we're the ministry. And uh, it's just awesome. And what's neat is even unsaved people come there and they talk about how peaceful it is and how lovely it is. And, and what have we done that makes the place different? And we just sort of smile, you know, because we, we're not going to offend them and uh, abuse the fact they came there just to have a nice time. And uh, they're having a nicer time than they thought they were going to get. So anyway, uh, training center there, up up on the right, etc. So we bought this in 2004, August 1st, we had our first class, and 25 people showed up from seven nations. And so God fulfilled his word that he would bring people from other nations. So uh, next overhead shows a picture of the North Wing, a little more perspective of what it looks like. Next picture uh, is a picture of the Royal Room, uh, this is a nice B&B, &B, folks. We had a lot of uh, churches and quite a few individuals joined with us after we bought it to really upgrade the place. We had an adopt-a-room program and really awesome help. And so the Royal Room got an amazing amount of help. Uh, its uh, bathroom has a jacuzzi in it next overhead. And uh, uh, these people came and redid it, put the jacuzzi in, tiled, did everything. It was really quite an amazing transformation. The next picture shows the Regal Room. All these, by the way, look out from this little mountain that we're on top of. Looks out over the town of Hendersonville, the surrounding mountains. Really quite a lovely view. Uh, we have the English Room in the next uh, overhead. You got the fire going there in the uh, north wing. And the next picture shows us uh, getting ready for our wedding. Uh, these are some wedding tents out there. Next picture shows our Olympic-sized swimming pool that we have. Uh, we're in a recreational area. The next picture shows uh, uh, High Falls out of DuPont State Forest. It's about a half hour drive from us. So people come there just to enjoy the great outdoors that God has created. The next picture shows us uh, Pisgah National Forest in the distance. We're looking out across the valley and whatever. So just a lovely area. We just feel so blessed to be there. Betsy and I love the outdoors. So we get to go hiking and exploring new waterfalls and things like that all the time. So um, the long and short of that is I have to become Southern for a moment and say, you all come, okay? You wanna come down to the mountains of North Carolina and have a vacation there. You're welcome to come join us at Echo Mountain Inn, okay? It's a wonderful place. So the next uh, picture overhead, one more, uh, is the message we want to bring tonight. 
which is why does God so desire our healing? Did you know that God desires your healing? It's not just an idea you and I had. This is an idea that God had. And it's been fun watching the change in the ad attitudes of the body of Christ over the last 20 some years. Back in the 1990s, uh, I would say maybe one Christian in 10 understood the importance of getting the heart healed and uh, the demons kicked out and getting our mind renewed and getting the curses broken off, understood how important that was to fulfill destiny, to know God, to know the Father heart of God, to have a close relationship with the Lord. Healing gets rid of those obstacles and those things that are in the way. I'm so excited about the fact you got a series of Father Heart messages coming up over the next few weeks because healing and the Father's heart, we like to say, are two sides of the same coin. They're, they go so together. The more healed we get, the more we can receive the Father's heart. The more we receive the Father's heart, the more healing we can enter into. And it just goes back and forth. It's cyclical and reinforcing. And the Dollies are just an awesome couple. You'll, you'll love uh, David and Faith, so be sure and come next Friday. And, um, but God's the one who originated this idea. He's the one who wants our healing. And he's working behind the scenes, even when you don't know it, to help you become more healed. And he's so convinced, Betsy and I, he will do everything he can that we allow him to do to bring about healing in our heart and move us from wherever we are more and more into that image of Jesus Christ, more and more being conformed. So God desires it, and the question is, why? I hope you ask him that question, and I hope the answer, which you will have in the next little bit, will convince you to get more serious about pursuing your healing. So let's uh, look at the major messages today, and uh, particularly since we're here at Toronto, I want to mention these. Uh, the major message out there today is one of healing and freedom or deliverance. Um, whereas it was like one in 10, 20 years ago, now it's probably one in three Christians understand. Maybe going toward two out of three. A major shift in a relatively short period of time. So one of the messages out there is God loves us and he wants to heal our heart. We get to be a part of that army. But there's another major message, that's the next one. And that's hearing the voice of the Lord. And probably Mark Berkler is at least the one we know who's one of the main carriers and champions of that message. God wants us to know that he's a talking God and he wants to talk to us, you and I. And I like to say he's radio station KGOD. He's on the air 24-7. He's always talking. It's just a matter of you and I tuning in and adjusting our dial so we can receive. He's talking all the time. There's another message, though, which is going the rounds, and that's the Father's Heart message. Jack Winters got that started probably 30 or more years ago. Jack Frost and James Jordan traveled with him for a while. Uh, then Toronto happened, and uh, the Father's Heart exploded out of here, affected James Jordan and Jack Frost. They propagated it even more. And uh, many people now are going around the world saying, you know what? God's a good God. He loves you. He's not up there with a baseball bat waiting for an opportunity to smack you. He wants to set you free of those things that cause you to sin and just love on you. But before we can really receive that message, it seems like we need to get some healing. And we need to begin to hear from God and hear him say to us directly into our heart, I love you. When I first began to pay attention and started journaling and listening to God, that's all he told me for two months was, Chester, you're a good boy. Now guess what my ungodly belief was? I'm not a good boy. I'm a bad boy, right? And I, after a while I said, God, why do you keep saying this? Well, you haven't quite believed it yet. I'm going to keep saying it until you let it penetrate your heart and believe it. And I didn't call it an ungodly belief in those days, but change that lie into a truth. And then there's one more I want to mention, and that's the bridegroom message. Now, who do we know who's carrying that one? Right? 
IHOP, Mike Beckel, he's carried that message, has for years, and it's a major component of what's going on in the body of Christ today. Now, most of us sort of get drawn to one or the other of these messages because that's where God's got our place, but they're all important and they're all very interconnected. It's another integrated approach. In fact, on the next overhead, I say this is God's integrated approach. He's bringing out all these different messages because we need to partake of them all. And that's one of the exciting things about Toronto and, and the other ministries who've come into the Revival Alliance and that they understand that it's not just my message, but it's our message. It's important for all of us. So the question is, why does God so desire a healing? And the answer lies in all four of these major messages. So let's go ahead, next one. Let's talk about the healing pathway of the bride. Now, if you're a member of the bride, raise your hand, okay? Everybody should raise your hands if you're born again, okay? Because you get enlisted automatically into the bride of Christ. Okay, let's look at the healing pathway of the bride. Next shows us what Jesus' goal is. Ephesians 5.27, that he may present it, the church, the bride, to himself a glorious church. Of course, you all know what the word glory means. That's light, God's presence, heaviness. And notice the characteristics of this church. It doesn't have spot or wrinkle, any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. King James says without uh, defect in any way. Blameless in all her ways. Wow, what a goal. You know, when I look in the mirror in the morning, I don't see a church without spot and wrinkle. How about you? We're not there yet. In fact, we sometimes refer to our ministry as a spot and wrinkle removal ministry. <laughs> and you know how you remove spots. You know, you take some chemicals and you rub, or you get rid of wrinkles with a hot iron and some pressure, right? And, and so that's what the sanctification process looks like sometimes. But um, I think Jesus is determined about having that perfect bride. It's hard to con uh, contemplate how that can come about. But if we want to do our part to hasten the return of the Lord, we need to deal with the spots and wrinkles in our own lives. So we're back to sins of the fathers and curses, ungodly beliefs, soul, spirit hurts, and demonic oppression. Those four sources are from where all our problems come. And they're all interconnected. Okay, next so we come through the door down here on the left side of the overhead. That's the door where Jesus stands and knocks. It says, if anybody invites me in, I will come in and sup with him. And so we come through that door and we get born again. That incorruptible seed comes into our heart. And the Holy Spirit's job now is to expand and take over. His job is to clean house and become the chief director. Okay? The devil, of course, opposes that and says, no, this is my place. I've had it for years, and you can't come in here. But it's too late. You and I have already made a cho choice and with faith accepted God's birthright coming into our heart. We've been born from above. So the devil keeps resisting, but the Holy Spirit now draws us on. And in Philippians, it talks about work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out the sanctification process. What we understand now is he's saying, get rid of these four areas in your life, every part of your life. Deal with the ancestral sins and curses. Get your mind renewed, one ungodly be belief at a time, one lie being converted into the truth. Get your heart healed, one hurt at a time until they're all gone. Get the demons cast out, one demon at a time until they're no more. It's not an instantaneous process, but it's an ongoing process, and it just keeps getting easier and easier as you get the initial junk cleaned out. So it's sort of like God's drawing us, the Holy Spirit's bringing. And the next overhead, we have this Father heart of God. Did you know that's what God's heart looks like? <laughs> and like he said to John in Revelation 4, come on up here, folks. Come on up here, Charlie. Come on up here, Jane. Let me show you things you know not of. 
The Father's heart draws us to come up higher. He just wants to cuddle us. He just wants to show us he's a good God. So here's the Father's heart message, teaching us and drawing us into the things of God. Meanwhile, we're hearing God, and we're getting more and more healed, so we hear him better, and it's easier for us to trust and to move out of our orphanness and to begin to move into being one of God's firstborn sons. It's an awesome thing that God's doing. And what a privilege that we are alive in this day and age when all these messages are coming out and God has got us in the culmination of the ages. The next overhead shows us uh, Revelation 19.7. This is all about, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we get down here in the middle of verse uh, 7, and it says the bride, his bride, has made herself ready. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but notice it does not say Jesus has made the bride ready. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit has made the bride ready. It doesn't even say Father God has made the bride ready. The bride has made herself ready. I don't know about you, but when I first ran into, into that, it was like, tilt? I can't do anything. I can't you know, get into the white, fine linen, the righteous acts of the saint. I can't heal myself. I didn't compute initially. I understand it better now, probably only partially still. But what it's telling us is the bride has a responsibility to enter into the healing process. It's not just sitting back, being passive, going to church on Sunday. And how many of you heard, God, uh, heard people say, well, if God wants to heal me, he knows my address. He can find me. You know, I live on such, such street, such, such an avenue, address. There's a place where God's waiting for us to put action to our faith and go to Toronto or go here or go there. Wherever he is, put feet to our faith. Faith without works is, is dead, right? So this is one form of works get ourselves positioned so God can operate on us. He is the ultimate healer, yes, but we have a part to play, and that's what it means here when it says the bride has made herself ready. Let's have the next overhead. So here she is. Isn't she beautiful? Beautiful bride, all healed up, without spot and wrinkle, perfect for Jesus. You know, Jesus is not coming back for a wimpy bride, a bride who's just a teenager. He's not coming back for a bride who cannot stand alongside of him and be his partner. And one of the things we've learned is that um, the best young lady, this is for you men now, okay? Some of, you, some of us, it's too late, but for you young men who are still looking for a bride, okay? The best place to look is for a young lady whose father loves her, just cherishes her, just loves her and adores her and helps her mature and she's solid and steady and confident in who she is and she's comfortable in her womanhood and she's ready to receive love and give love. That's what Jesus is looking for in his bride, somebody who can receive his love and give his love. By the way, young ladies, it works for you too. If you want to find the right man, go find one whose father loves him, not the mother. The mother has an important role to play, but in terms of pulling us into maturity and manhood and womanhood, the father has that role. That's why we've got such a messed up society nowadays, because fathers aren't doing that. But Look for that young man whose father has pulled him into a place of maturity and solidness, and he knows who he is, and he's comfortable with that. And he can give and receive love. So for those of us who didn't do it right, <laughs> we got to go to the Father, God, and let him heal us. It's too late for our earthly father, most of us. I'm looking around. Most of us are, you know, into adulthood. The only choice now, folks, is to go to Father God, and he will do it. Betsy and I are total examples of this. We were really messed up. 
We're only a little bit messed up now, okay? And God's working on the rest. The next overhead shows us another scripture that uh, emphasizes our responsibility. Here in 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing about I'll be a f uh, the promises of God. I'll be a father unto you. You shall, you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, or filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. This is a real shock for people who think that uh, it all depends on God, or who think they got perfected at the time of salvation. You know, I'm a new creation. Everything's done. I just sit back and be good for nothing the rest of my life, you know? It says, let us cleanse ourselves. There's no way we can avoid some kind of responsibility here of entering into, choosing, engaging, pursuing God's healing. And notice it's not just the flesh. It says flesh and spirit. Our spirits are not perfected at the time of salvation. That incorruptible seed comes in and the Holy Spirit's job is to take over, but it doesn't happen in an instant. Our spirits need to be cleansed and, uh, and uh, our mind in our spirit needs to be renewed just as our mind and our soul needs to be renewed. And so we've got a responsibility. I want you to get that, folks. Don't sit back wondering what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to pursue God and know his Father's heart and receive his healing. And he's given us the keys as to how to receive it, the integrated approach. Next overhead. So here we got the bride ready for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the bride has made herself ready. Hallelujah. It's going to be a glorious time. You know, we, did you know the Bible says that we affect when that happens? When the bride is ready, Jesus will come back. It's not the other way around. Jesus comes back and he gets the bride ready. No, when the bride is ready, he'll come back. Next overhead. So our choice, we can be resistive, be passive, say it's going to hurt too much, I don't want to go back there. Bob and Joyce talked about how their week of healing was the hardest and best week of their life. It does expose some of the past pain. Nothing like what it was when we got it in the first place, but we do go back and we work with the Lord, and there's a personal responsibility that we have to take. We have to confess sin. We have to ask forgiveness. We have to forgive those who offended us and sinned against us. And that's what's keeping God from healing you already, is you haven't done yet the, uh, met the conditions of his conditional promises where he says, when you forgive somebody else, then I'll forgive you, for example. So there's a personal responsibility. I would encourage you all to be cooperative, do what the Holy Spirit says, and pursue your healing. Hallelujah. Yes, let's go for it. Let's go for our healing. God, God wants it because Jesus wants to come back. How about if you were a lovesick man or woman wanting and waiting for your marriage, wouldn't you want to hasten it? That's what Jesus is waiting for. Let's cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He'll open doors for healing for us. Let's go for it. Naomi, that's so wonderful. You shut the door to fear and open the door to what God wants. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Next overhead. Again, Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. There's a partnership here where we have to enter in and God does his part. We need to meet our personal responsibilities, the, con the conditions, and God would do his part. So you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault. Wow, what a goal. Is that possible while we're still alive? I think it is. It's a goal. We ought to at least keep going toward it, whether we get there or not while we're, you know, still alive. But let's go for it. Next over here. Here's a good incentive. 
I'm trying to give you lots of motivations. I hope you've figured that out. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat, says in the King James, from the fat of the land, meaning the, the most abundant produce. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Ouch. So let's be willing and obedient. How about this? Let's make a declaration. Don't have to do this if you don't want to. God, I choose to be willing. God, I choose to be willing. My heart is to be obedient. My heart is to be obedient. Help, me Help me hear you better. Nestle up in your heart better. So I can hear what you want me to do, and I commit to do it. Amen. And you will eat of the fat of the land. Hallelujah. Next overhead, please. Here's the process. It'd be nice if we could get healed up in an instantaneous uh, point, but because of personal responsibility and growth and all that, it doesn't happen instantaneously. When God's giving the battle plan for conquering uh, uh, Canaan land or Israel uh, to the Israelites about conquering Canaan land. He's talking about the ites, the Canaanites and others. He says, I won't drive him out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild beasts too numerous for you. But little by, little by little, I'll drive them out from before you until you have increased enough to possess the land. So the way the healing process goes is we get some healing and then we need to consolidate our gains, walk in it, prove it and not lose it back to the devil. Then we get some more healing. We get some more, we find out about more sins of Father's curses and we break them, get rid of them. We find out about some more lies we've been believing, we convert them into godly beliefs. We find out there's some more hurts in our heart, we get them healed. Sometimes we go deeper with hurts that we got healed of earlier. And then we cast out the demons that have used all that as legal rights and kept stirring things up and trying to keep us trapped. And then we possess that, we hold it, and then we go for more, okay? So a lifetime, a lifestyle of pursuing God's healing. You willing to commit to that? If you're not already engaged in this, let me encourage you. It just keeps getting better and better and better. Next overhead. So that's what we got, the four ministry areas. And Betsy's gonna come now and share her testimony. And she had a rather rough start in life and she needed a lot of healing. And so she's going to share with you what God has done in her life, how he trained us about his healing, and then we're going to give you an opportunity at the end to receive healing yourself, okay? Thank you, so, Lord. Hey there. Yeah. How are you hey. doing? <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, Is it on? Good. Yeah. Yes, it's on. Okay. Great. I just want to share my story with you. Um, and I want to start back in 1940. There was a young teenage girl named Virginia who lived in a small coastal town in North Carolina. And she was a happy girl, had friends, did well in school, just, you know, was enjoying life, had a boyfriend. Everything was going well, belonged to the church. And then life began to shift for her in a way that she didn't quite understand. She started waking up sick in the morning. She didn't understand it. She stayed home from school a few days and thought maybe everything would be okay, but it didn't go away. And one of her friends said to her, Virginia, is there any chance you could be pregnant? She thought about it, and she realized there was one possibility she could be. And the sickness continued, and... Um, she was just really panicked. How can I tell my parents, what shall I do? I don't know what to do. And as she was trying to figure this out, one, one morning her mom called and said, Virginia, come down here. I have made you a wonderful breakfast. It's your favorite. It's cinnamon on oatmeal and raisins and all the things you like. Just come on down. And Virginia went down and she said, Mom, I have to tell you something. I can't eat, I'm sick, and I'm pregnant. And her mother just turned her back on her and began to weep. 
And Virginia didn't know what to do. And just about that time, her father walked in. And her father heard her say, I'm pregnant. And he began to rant and rave and scream and holler and say, how could you do this to us, Virginia? Virginia, we've told you better than this. What have you done to shame our family? And over the next several days, there was a horrible tension in the family. You know what it's like when families gather and you have a meal and you just kind of choke down your food and try to think of something to say and it's just tense and awkward. Thursday night of that week, her dad said, Virginia, it's going to be okay. I have a solution to your problem. Virginia didn't quite understand, but she said, he said, I've made an appointment with a doctor first thing in the morning. And so very, very early that morning, because, of course, abortion was illegal in 1940, he put her in the car, and they drove to a doctor's office where there was one other, only one other car there. And he got out of the car, and she was waiting to get out of the car, and all of a sudden, this voice just filled the car. And it said, daughter, don't do it. Two wrongs don't make a right. And Virginia turned around, who's speaking to me? And then she realized it was the voice of the Lord. And she locked the car, and she refused to get out. The voice of the Lord saved my life that day because I was the baby in her womb. Her family in tremendous shame sent her away and she went to a Salvation Army shelter in Durham, North Carolina, which was set up for teenagers who were pregnant. And there, some months later, I was born. And I want to tell you there was no celebration there wasn't anybody there to welcome me. There weren't any little pink blankets and little pink booties and little flowers and little everything. She was immediately rushed to the hospital because she was very, had lost a lot of blood in the delivery. And I was very immediately given away to um, an organization to somehow try to find some parents. Does anybody want this little girl? Can we find a family that would take her, this unwanted child? Now, everything about me physically was quite normal. All of my fingers worked. All of my toes moved. Everything looked okay on the outside. But on the inside, there was already a brokenness. How many of you know you can look great on the outside? and really have a lot of brokenness deep on the inside. And so that was what I experienced. And I just want to tell you about three ways that brokenness was expressed in my life. The first one was that I never felt I belonged. Wherever I was, I never felt good enough. I never felt part of anything. Even if I was the leader, I felt on the outside of the circle. And so I carried this thing of, I don't belong, I'm a mistake, I'm an accident, I shouldn't be here. Something is the matter with me that never can get fixed. And that was the way I lived my life. It was what I believed, it was what I felt, situation after situation after situation. And I just thought, this is my lot in life. This is how it is. Some of you out there have felt that kind of thing like, I'm just stuck with this. And another thing that was in my life was um, terrible fear, particularly the fear of death. And when I would go to bed at night, I would wait until my parents went to bed, and then I would turn on a light. Or I would always have a flashlight. I never went anywhere without a flashlight, so I would never be in the dark because I just felt like I'm going to die. I'm going to die tonight. I don't know why, I don't know how, but I'll never make it through the night. And if any little thing just went, da, just a little bump in the night, I just was unglued, 
just ah, just sweaty all over, just a mess. And so I lived like that way, way into my 30s and 40s. I mean, this was not just a childhood thing. This was a gripping fear of death that was so miserable and such a torment. The other thing that was really strong and powerful in my life was lust. And from the time I was about six or seven, I began to have pictures in my mind of people undressed. And I, I hated it. I was saved at an early age. I just felt, I am so sick. What is the matter with me that I see all this nasty stuff? And I don't want to, but I don't know how to get free. And if you've ever had something in your life that you desperately wanted to get rid of, but somehow you just couldn't, it just was bigger than you were, and you feel like a failure as a Christian, so you take two steps forward, but that thing is like a ball and chain just pulling you back. What a nasty person you are. How could you have those thoughts? How could God love you when you've got all of that junk in your mind? Who do you think you are? And so I had those three things going on in my life. And I, had a, I grew up with, I was adopted when I was a few months old into a very godly family, a loving family, a family that knew how to discipline as well in a, in a godly way. And so I had a lot of care and a lot of prayer poured into my life. And so I had the best of all possible circumstances. But inside, I just felt a deep, deep brokenness. I wanted to serve the Lord. <laughs> Always wanted to serve the Lord. But I felt such a mess. How could he use somebody like me? Somebody fearful. Somebody who doesn't belong. Somebody who's full of lustful thoughts. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm so sorry I'm who I am. I'd like to be so much better for you, but I don't know how to get there. Then I had an early failed marriage. It's not terribly surprising, but that was kind of the final blow. Now he really can't use me because I'm divorced. And so that was just it. And for, for several years, I was very suicidal. It was like I, I got out knives, I got pills, I got everything, and, and I would always go, I had two little boys, and I would go in and I would say, well, I need to look at them, pray for them one last time before I do this. And somehow I would look at their little faces and their little arms drooped over the bed, and I said, I can't leave them, they don't have a dad now, and I can't leave them with no parents at all. And so my life was not anything to brag about. It was just broken, discouraged, miserable. And I didn't know, I didn't grow up in circles where I would know anything about inner healing or, you know, I knew the word, but I didn't, I didn't know that God wants to pursue us to bring healing. And then... In my early 30s, after Chester and I had gotten married, and I, I decided I'd try it again. I would try it again. That was a huge step to try it again. But I did, and very soon into that time, he and I together met this woman who was very fascinating to both of us, but especially me. And I kind of became a leech. I grabbed hold of her. What I know now is that she was full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I just didn't know. Why am I so attracted? And so every opportunity I had, I said, come over to my house. Come talk to me. Come spend time with me. One day we were there in the living room, sitting on the floor, drinking peppermint tea and just talking about girl kind of things. And she said to me, something that was just totally out of my box. She said, Betsy, I think the Lord wants to say something to you. And I said, the Lord? 
<laughs> wants to say something to me? What do you mean? And she said, well, why don't you just close your eyes and let's see what happens. Just get quiet. And because I trusted her, I was willing to do that. But totally, I don't know what on earth this is. And so I'm there, and I close my eyes, and all of a sudden it's like I see this amazing moving picture. And I see, I'm, I'm watching, and I see Jesus walk into this room. And I think, well, that's really amazing. And then I see him walk over, and I see there's a little tiny newborn there, a little baby girl that's just been born. And I see him go over and pick her up and look at her with all of the love in his eyes that would fill a universe. And I'm just saying, what is this? And then all of a sudden, something very deep inside of me began to break. And I began to weep. And as I was weeping, I heard him say to me, I'm so glad you're here. I'm here to welcome you. I'm so glad I've waited for you. And I have wonderful things for your life. I can't even tell you about them now, but they're, they're wonderful and they're going to fulfill you. And I knew that I knew that I knew that it was real, and I knew that God had spoken to me. And something very deep in my heart began to be healed. When the God of the universe welcomes you, it doesn't matter if there weren't any flowers and pink blankets, because he's come. And I felt chosen for the first time, and special and wanted, and like I had a purpose. Then it was absolutely amazing how the Word began to come alive to me. And I saw Psalm 139, you were knitted together in your mother's womb. And I realized that God had watched over me as I had been formed, that it wasn't just an egg and a sperm coming together. There was a holy, divine process where he had put the parts together. And then things like, I chose you before the foundation of the world. The word began to come alive, and that began to heal me at another level. And Chester and I didn't understand it, so we would go back to the word and I would see how Jesus came to people and had these encounters and how he spoke life to them. He wanted to bring life to them. And he was bringing life to me. So that happened when I was about 35. And I want to jump forward 17 years just to tell you one more piece of that story. When I was 53 and both of the parents that raised me had gone to be with the Lord, I had a very deep desire to see if I could find my birth mother and say thank you. I wanted to tell her because I was, you know, I was 53. I was a mature woman at this point. And I just wanted to say, I don't know what you had to go through back in 1940, but I know it wasn't easy. And I want to thank you. And I want to tell you that my life has turned out well. And I'm enjoying my life, and, and it's good, and, and you're part of that. And so I got an adoption consultant that knew how to do these things, and she asked me, she said, is it okay if, if she doesn't want to talk to you? Is it okay if she's not living anymore? If it's okay if she's just closed that chapter of her life? And, and that's it. And I said, yeah, it's okay because I had a good support system in the Lord and in my family. And so, what would you do? <laughs> At that point, I panicked. Like, well, what am I supposed to say to this woman? I've never met her. I don't know her name. How do I start this? And so, three days later, the consultant called me back, and she said, I found her. Her name is Virginia. She gave me her name, her address, the names of her sons, and her telephone number. <laughs> so, shaking, 
all over with Chester's arm on my shoulder, I made a phone call to Virginia. And I followed the advice this consultant gave me, and I said to her, after we were introduced on the phone, I said, does October 5th, 1940, mean anything to you? And there was a long, long silence. And this is what she said to me. Very slowly she said, you could only be one person. And I want you to know that I have prayed for you every day of your life. I want you to know that the hardest thing I ever did was say goodbye to you. I want you to know that I've wept on your birthday because I didn't know where you were or how you were. And she began to pour out a mother's heart. And she said, I never stopped loving you. I just wanted you to have more than I could give you. And you know, sometimes God uses people to heal our hearts as well. And a whole nother layer of healing took place. And we talked for several hours that day. I knew her for 11 years before her death. And we had a very nice friendship and relationship. But God, you see, he was working behind the scenes in a life that didn't know about inner healing, a life that didn't know so much of what most of you out there know today. But I was just a broken person saying, God, I desperately need you. As Chester and I began to made a decision to go to Bible college, and he mentioned that tonight, I was still, you know, sleeping with the light on. <laughs> Wasn't fun to explain to him before we got married. Uh, by the way, honey, uh, I got this little thing I want to tell you about. I hope you don't mind if the light's on. Ah! So there we are, and we're still doing that. And I go to the Bible school, go to sign up for my courses, and the registrar looks at me, and she said, Oh, she says, by the way, honey, if you ever want to get rid of that spirit of the fear of death, I can help you. I know just how to do that. And I went, ah, <laughs> my demons are showing. <laughs> So we said yes, and two days later we went to a first deliverance. I didn't understand deliverance. I just knew that Jesus had given us authority because it said that in Mark 16. And they prayed for me, and there was a real struggle because this thing had had, it oppressed me for years, and it thought it was the boss, and it didn't want to leave. But as we continued, there were some words of knowledge and a continuous out in the name of Jesus, out in the name of Jesus. And the thing actually said to me, I could hear it inside talking to me, and it said, I'm going to choke you and I'm going to kill you. And they're going to think you're just choking, but you're going to be okay. But I'm going to kill you. You see, those demonic spirits try to do kill, steal, and destroy. That's what they want to do in your life. And there was such a manifestation. And then we had a word of knowledge, and, one of, and then we finally said together, and inside I was just, I was choking, I was sputtering, but I was agreeing with them. You have to leave, you have to leave, you have to leave. Go in the name of Jesus. And I felt that thing leave me. And I went home, and I turned off the light, and I slept in peace, and I have slept these remaining years, 30-something years, I have slept in, with the peace of God in my heart, and the end of that demonic torment. Did I want to have a deliverance ministry? I don't think so. But I knew there were other people that were captives, like I had been held captive, like I felt like I could never do what God had 
because of the captivity in my life. And then I heard about a, a man that did more deliverance, and I went and I told him my whole life story about the torment of lust, about how I had felt the shame of feeling like the most nasty person in the world. And he began to explain to me how when you're illegitimate, all of the sexual spirits have access to you to torment you, that you didn't have to do anything sinful, that there was an open door into your life. And as he prayed for me, and we told all, you know, confess sin, repented, and told that stuff to leave, and it left. And I went home feeling clean. I went home feeling holy before the Lord. He says he wants to make us holy. And he does. He wants you, each one of you that struggled in this kind of area, to feel pure and holy. That he is Lord of your life. That he rules and reigns. And so he showed me, Betsy, you've believed so many lies. I want to bring you my truth. And we began to, break, to believe his truth and replace those old ungodly beliefs with a wonderful truth that I belonged. You belong. Friends, you belong. Don't let the enemy take you down the stream like he did me. There's a deep belonging, not because of who we are, but because we are chosen by him. And so he showed us about generational sins. And I realized that there must have been sexual sin, fear, shame, all of that stuff operating. And you know, if you don't know your bloodline parents, Holy Spirit is so faithful to reveal that. He's so faithful. And you know, the good news of all this you know, is God works behind the scenes to draw us into his healing. And he's no respecter of persons. He wants everything for you yes. that he's given me. Everything. If you need your heart healed, he wants that. If you need those generational curses broken off of you, he wants you to be free and your children to be free and your children's children to be free. He Amen. wants this to be the time the generational line changes. Yes. And if, he, if you struggle with lies, he wants to bring you his truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so tonight, he's here to heal you. He's here to bring the same kind of healing he brought in my life. It's not a complicated process. And I want to, what we'd like to do is Chester's going to come and pray for us as a group. And then I want to have George and Laurie and Barbara Rundle and uh, Kevin and Linda Joy if they're here and then others of the ministry team. Just come up. And I want you to come without shame. It's not shame to get healed. It's only shame to sit and know you need it and not receive it. That's the only shame. So his invitation is open to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, love. Yes. One of the most uh, awful curses in the Bible has to do with illegitimacy. It's expressed in Deuteronomy 23.2. And it says, he of illegitimate birth, he and his descendants for ten generations, not three or four, but ten generations, are excluded from the assembly of the righteous. In other words, they could not go to the synagogue. So how does that play out in today's world? What we find is people who have illegitimacy in their background, whether the if they're illegitimate, then that's obviously very direct. But if it's back up in the generations, um, all the way back for 10 generations, then they're the ones who hang around the perimeter of the church. They're the ones who say, this isn't a very friendly church. Nobody reaches out to me to say hello. 
no one cares if I'm here or not, and they criticize and they complain. But meanwhile, they're walking around with this shield around them, a spiritual shield which says, I don't belong here. I'm excluded from the assembly of the righteous. And it operates that way. And as we break the power of that curse because of what Jesus has done for us, people just enter in and they join in, they become leaders, they enter into the destiny that God has for them. So I would like to pray with you to break the power of that curse because the likelihood is somebody somewhere, if not a bunch of somebodies in a bunch of somewheres, in 10 generations in your family line are illegitimate. By the way, I told you there were 30 people in four generations. How many people are there in 10 generations? Keeps doubling every, ten, every generation. There's at least 1,024, and depending on how it works out, it could be 2,047. Out of 2,000 plus people, what's the likelihood of there being at least one occurrence of illegitimacy? Pretty close to 100% maybe? So probably all of us have at least a little bit of this pressure on our lives, and maybe a lot, depending on how close the illegitimacy is in terms of generations. So what I'd like to do is lead you in a prayer of confessing the sins of our ancestors, and, f and then releasing them, forgiving them, and then we'll, uh, I'll lead you through several steps of forgiveness, and then we'll break the power of that curse. You okay with that? If you don't want to do that, you don't have to enter in. But I'd like us to get into an attitude of warfare. So how about those of you who want to do this, let's stand up. This, this is exercising your authority that the Lord Jesus has delegated to you. And just to sort of cement that in place, let's uh, quote James 4, 7. Say it after me. Submit yourself unto God. Resist the, Resist the devil, and he will flee. He will flee. So, Lord God, Lord God, I submit to you tonight. To you tonight. Thank, you Thank you that I'm your child. I step into that authority you give me, and I exercise it to be free of the curse of illegitimacy. Lord, I confess that in my family line there has been illegitimacy. I forgive and release those people. I don't blame them or point the finger. I'm not going to hold them accountable in any way for their sins affecting my life. I release them totally. Now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for all the ways I've entered into the effects of this sin that I've let the consequences control my life and so I haven't been all that I could have been. I receive your forgiveness and now I choose to forgive myself for walking in these consequences, for hanging around the perimeter of the church, for not being friendly with other people for always keeping my defenses up in case I might be wounded or hurt. I totally break the power of that curse out of my life and my descendants' lives and on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, I receive to a greater measure membership Membership in your body, membership in your bride, and my identity as a son or daughter of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So now if the worship team would be willing to come and provide some softer kind of music so people can pray and the ministry teams and RTF teams come up to the front. We'd like to just give you that opportunity yeah. for that fresh healing touch. So any personal prayer in the area of illegitimacy or fears or sexual sins, all the things that Betsy was talking about tonight. 
as well as other things. It's not yeah. limited to that, but no. certainly including that. Thank you, Lord. Twice chosen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, why don't you? I just want to say one of the best books I've read is her book called Twice Chosen. So those of you, this you know, striking a chord, uh, just this whole area that she was sharing about being adopted, phenomenal story. They also have some other great resources in the bookstore, but uh, do pick up this book called Twice Chosen by Betsy. So, so let's see, where's our, where's our ministry team? Okay, here's one, two, three. Who else is... Ministry team, come on up. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno. Lord, I just pray for our ministry team right now. And I thank you for the anointing that breaks yokes. I thank you, Lord, for revelation, knowledge of roots of things as they go to lay hands and pray. I thank you for your power and authority and I thank you for the tenderness of your Father's heart to be released into people that are hurting. So, Lord, just release your heart out of every person who comes tonight. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Let's just have one line across here and then line up on the side and the ministry team will come to you. But just one, one deep right here and that will give people a little more privacy as they're getting pay, prayed for. And the team will come to you once they've covered this first, first group of people. Thank you so much, Betsy and Chester. Um, could I, we're going to need some catchers here tonight as well, just in case. So I'm going to ask the ministry team to just be aware that, you know, there's not to pray actually at the moment, if that's okay. But I want you to, I want to encourage you to stay around. So let me just try to line you up. Is there anybody who's able tonight to help assist us in catching? Just raise your hand. Okay. We could. Women, ladies are fine to, to help us in that as well, but just be aware that if you've never done this before, some of the ministry team will coach you a little bit through this as well. Make sure that you do this safely. So just in case you fall, we don't want anyone to get hurt or anything like that. So ministry team, could I get you to raise your hand just really up high, please? Could I get you, those who want to assist tonight, just to... Find that person with their hand up and just join them right now, quickly. Is that okay? Because we don't want to stop the flow of what God is doing here right now. So can I ask you to move quickly on that? So is everyone okay? There's still one hand up here. Two, three. Okay, we're going to need some more help. Men, are you able to help? Uh, I assure you, as you help and assist, you yourself will be blessed. So, there's a few. The other thing that we, okay, so you're okay? Okay, good. All right, so we're good to go. Father, I just ask that you would just continue to pour out your heart right now on many tonight as their hearts, if they've come here, Lord, to be healed up in their hearts, I ask for your presence to come and heal the heart, the woundedness in their heart, Lord. In Jesus' name. This is just a holy time, so if you need to leave, you're welcome to leave, but I just want to bless you, and I'm just going to ask that if you're in the back, just to just realize that this is just a place where we're just allowing God, and it's just a, a holy time. So we're going to ask that you bring the chatter somewhere else, if that's okay, maybe in the foyer and stuff. Father, bless you. Again, I want to remind you of next week, next Friday with the Dallies and the following week with the Duicks, Murray Duick, and then we're having Paul Kumar from India as well. He's a very prophetic man, so it's just an amazing time. You know, God's really just an amazing, amazing father and dad that we have.
you're waiting, just engage yourself with the presence of God. You know, I know that you're waiting for ministry to come around. There's about 10 of us tonight. But, you know, you can meet God right now even. As you're waiting. He won't leave you. He's not going to leave you behind tonight. need one more catcher. Was it, is it you, Michael? There's one more catcher. Okay. The lady over here needs a catcher. Okay, great. Thank you, Corrine. Thanks.